Um, the problems, and here I go into the second part of um, the uh, webinar, starting to really talk about um, KT. And I, um, I love this quote that's in blue at the top because knowledge um, is, knowledge translation is hard. It's really um, challenging to uh, be able to measure the changes in practice, in processes, in policy and structures that we're trying to do. And numerous reports and organizations have expressed policy and fiscal concerns because so much professional practice in a wide range of fields is not based on empirical evidence. And we know that research moves slowly, inconsistently, and very poorly into systems. Um, it moves very slowly into professional knowledge and skills, and it moves even more slowly into awareness and knowledge of the lay public. Um, and so many professionals still rely extensively on um, informal diffusion um, of information. That means that we underuse effective interventions and actions. Um, we sometimes use incorrect interventions. We overuse unhelpful or unproven interventions. Um, and uh, there's a variety of uh, research trying to look at that kind of delay. And a, even though there's some debate around that delay, um, a, day, a time frame that often gets called upon is 17 years to get empirical results into practice. Knowledge translation roots and definitions um, that um, I've put here in italic, a widely used definition that you can read. Um, and it uh, really, in Canada, um, how we think about knowledge translation um, largely comes out of the development of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, CIHR, which grow up, grew out of the Medical Research Council of Canada. And um, so those concepts are certainly the most widespread. Um, but there were um, languages earlier than that. And um, certainly if we go back to um, community development, um, agricultural distension department, the Cody Institute here at St. Francis Xavier, you'll see practices of knowledge translation right back to the 19 teens. Um, but I think it's useful to recognize that there are multiple terms, they're confused, they're conflated, they're nouns, they're verbs, and that confusion hinders uptake and implementation. Most of the definitions that will get used for knowledge translation um, are medically rooted. Um, certainly the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, which is a remarkable descendant of the Research Council, is still largely medical. Um, and so although our centre and our users specialise in public health, population health, social justice, community change, complexity, we're using models that have evolved and been tested mostly within medical systems and practices. And these are just two examples um, of images to show you that. At the same time, KT definitions are evolving. They're evolving rapidly. And um, I, I bring your attention to the third phrase there, um, getting the right information to the right people in the right format at the right time so as to influence decision making. And I name that in part because when our NCC was developing its current phase, um, we really tried to use that, trying to figure out audience format information, why that information, why, when, and all of that. Um, and I've used italic here because I think it's easy when we're talking about KT to lose track of why we're using uh, using KT and translating knowledge. And so those italics are my emphasis, not the authors. And um, for our own center, we're always translating knowledge to try and have that broad impact on how the social conditions that, that contribute to positive health are distributed. So my next little piece is really looking at a critical analysis of KT approaches. Um, and that cartoon's really just there for your pleasure. Um, I think what's important here is that um, 
it's a very active field. Um, our center is not speaking in isolation. We're one organization of many, many, many who are adapting KT um, to have greater impact as we learn how to practice KT. Knowledge translation in its most common forms, partly because of it coming out of a clinical and biological basis, is often mechanistic, rational, and positivist. And by mechanistic, I mean that it, it is assumed that inputs will lead to outputs, um, that if we do a particular thing, that we will get desired outcomes. It's rational in that it's objective, and it is assumed not to be influenced significantly by the scientist or user who is somewhat removed and should be dispassionate. And so that means there are um, unambiguous definitions and findings uh, wherever possible that you're trying to use. Um, and it's positivist in that it's assumed that both um, methods, actions, decisions are all verifiable. And yet most of social science understands knowledge as not being passive, not being separated from the generator or the user. And I would argue that knowledge is never passive. Generators and users cognitively adapt, adjust, and respond to knowledge at all stages of generation and use. And um, when we allow the emphasis on uh, rationality and verifiability and replicability to be at the heart of how we see knowledge translation, then we understand it as semi-independent or fully independent of the use, the audience, and the context. And, um, and yet um, population health and public health are so contextually um, specific and um, so much um, influenced by who participates in um, processes, practices, policy development. So um, I would argue that knowledge translation is um, gains from participation on all sides. KT is often understood as a transfer process or problem. It's seen as linear. It's framed as moving from the researcher or the producer or generator to the user, the practitioner, the decision maker, the policy maker. And, um, and so um, we can see there are researchers that have seen um, ways to improve knowledge translation by messaging better or by influencing reception. Um, and yet when we have a linear approach, that kind of push out or pull in, um, we are separating the knowledge generator and the user. And this privileges the academic researcher over practitioner scholars. And I'm using that term that was popularized by Trevor Hancock at the University of Victoria and Louise Potvin at the University of Montreal, who created a section in the Canadian Journal of Public Health um, to be written by practitioner scholars to tease out new knowledge that arises through evaluation, through reflection, through on-the-job analysis to generate practice-based evidence that will complement research-based evidence. Um, the linear also diminishes or precludes reciprocity. It downplays the partnership and collaboration that um, enriches both knowledge generation and knowledge use. I'll also add that by focusing on the transfer of information, um, most people involved in knowledge mobilization pay less attention to knowledge production challenges. And by that I mean, is the question right? Are the findings interpreted in a way that they'll be useful? Are the methods useful, timely? Are they culturally appropriate? Um, is the knowledge going to be applicable at this time? Who gets to control the findings or the design? And that's often missing, and particularly in um, the world today as we're looking at um, cultural diversity and um, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, um, those questions of who's producing it, how, 
with whom had become critical. In the same way that knowledge control issues often don't find their way into knowledge translation frameworks. Who has the power? Who gains through the finding? But also through um, how do we um, uh, manage the processes all the way along? Um, and that brings me to the fact that the metaphor of translation itself has been critiqued. Um, these two researchers who are Australian based um, have really posited that the terminology of translation itself constrains how we conceptualize and study the link between knowledge and practice. And so if you look at non-medical disciplines again, such as philosophy, sociology, organizational science, we would get at knowledge being constructed, created, embodied, performed, negotiated. And in fact, often that would be collectively or co-created, co-constructed, etc. Um, these same authors, I'll do a, a slight aside, these same authors are promoting a concept of mind lines and I encourage you to look at that um, work um, and I've given you reference. And it's really um, trying to understand about how we internalize and collectively reinforce tacit guidelines and knowledge. Um, and very often that tacit knowledge supersedes our attention to evidence-based practice guidelines. And so um, how does that, how do those mind lines happen? And how can you actually influence those mind lines um, by using the kind of methods that our center use of relationship brokering, collaborative learning, attention to leadership, and integrating that right inside knowledge translation. Another um, limitation of KT as it is often performed is that it is hierarchical um, and it's hierarchical in terms of whose knowledge gets credited and also what types of knowledge are credited. And, um, and so um, when you look at that kind of um, a ranking of random control trials as being a pinnacle of the quality of evidence, that's certainly true for many types of evidence, but it's not going to be the most appropriate um, uh, method for generating knowledge about complexity, about population change, about um, those kind of areas where tacit knowledge is deeply integrated. There have been some excellent analyses, and I give um, two or three in the um, a little footnote down at the bottom. Anita Kotari at the University of Western Ontario um, has done some wonderful work kind of looking at um, um, these kind of questions, as has Carmen Ellison um, at the University of Alberta working with the NCC for Aboriginal Health, um, trying to broaden how we think about knowledge um, and what knowledge has value. Um, this uh, challenge for KT arises from the earlier ones that I've mentioned, um, a real culture gap, if you would, between knowledge generators and users. Um, there's been some nice research and publications looking at the differing worlds of researchers um, and how researchers and policymakers often um, use different analysis, bring different philosophies, using different language. They both have technical language, but it's quite different technical language already. And um, a recent Patrick uh, Fafard at the University of Ottawa has done a fair bit of work um, thinking through public health's limited use as a field of political science, even though we're trying to change healthy public policy. And Patrick and Stephen Hoffman, the uh, director of the Institute for Population and Public Health, earlier in 2019, this year, um, did a piece trying to really promote concepts, understanding of multiplicity, of hierarchy, of networks that arise out of political science to inform public health practice and public health um, knowledge translation. 
and I'll add a study by Formoso in 2007 um, found that systematic reviews are often geared towards other researchers. So even though they have the intention of influencing policy or some other system change, um, they're not written for that audience. They're written from the researcher to the researcher. Timing is another challenge. Policy uh, influence windows are transient, um, and yet um, researchers will often take years to generate um, research and refine the knowledge that they want out there. Decision makers often want really quick answers, um, but we don't have strong structures and systems to hold the knowledge, to do that pushing out at the right moment um, when it's needed. And although we have integrated um, KT um, within how CIHR approaches uh, knowledge translation, and we have end of grant knowledge translation, we don't have good systems for five years after the grant or 10 years after the grant. And um, I'll give the example of a timing a piece, Everett Rogers, who originated the diffusion of innovation theory um, and the term early adopter, um, he did that work on diffusion of innovation in 1962. He republished it, or it was republished in the 1980s, and it wasn't until the mid-2000s that it, um, that work became um, one of the most cited social science books. Um, so um, it had a much longer life than the systems that we have readily available to get that out. And so, and this is at a time when we're diminishing our public libraries. Um, KT, um, few supports and limited capacity beyond just getting systems out there, particularly for those of us who are doing KT separate from the researcher role. Um, there's very little um, funding that helps play that role um, to either innovate in knowledge translation methods or to fund independent knowledge translation to work alongside um, researchers. And yet there is research to show that policy makers and influencers have limited skills in acquiring and assessing knowledge and researchers and other knowledge generators often lack communication and mobilization skills. The final constraint and limitation that I'm gonna name for um, KT as it is frequently planned is that equity is too often sidelined. In fact, Vivian Welch at the University of Ottawa has talked about um, very few systematic reviews considering their effects on health equity and they fall short by not asking about or ignoring health equity and they fall short by not taking design um, around equity-oriented context analyses um, into play. Um, Peter Tugwell and uh, other colleagues of his, also uh, Peter's out of the University of Ottawa, have done um, articles um, looking at the fact that systematic reviews um, lean towards aggregating um, results, and yet when we're trying to get it in equities, we absolutely must disaggregate and analyze um, from a different approach. A uh, 2011 um, forum in Toronto um, that was written up by um, staff at St. Michael's Hospital um, um, found a number of um, challenges in terms of how KT uh, for policy change models relates to equity focused urban health and how well KT did and how well research itself did um, played into three different tensions. Did the content of the evidence um, dominate over the context of decision making? Both of those need to be in there. Were there collaborative or conflictual relationships between the generators and the users of knowledge? And who held the power in policy making um, 
and how do you recognize that the changes are normative as well as empirical, a little different than some aspects of um, health and medicine. Um, our center looked at how um, appropriate um, knowledge translation frameworks and models were for um, promoting and changing the conditions that lead to health equity. We were encouraged to do that by Louise Papin at the University of Montreal, who was then on our board, and Erica de Ruggiero, who was then the um, deputy director at the Institute for Population and Public Health, and who's now at U of T. To take on that project, we contracted Colleen Davison at Queen's, who worked with um, Sume and Dume Eo from our staff and myself. Um, we used uh, literature and, uh, and the then somewhat new WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health um, to identify um, factors that would be important and um, in KT and these factors align well with the research that I talked about earlier from Tugwell and Welch and so these six factors are here um, has consideration of focus e uh, equity even been um, involved um, is knowledge conceptualized broadly so that indigenous uh, tacit qualitative knowledge come in are community members represented? Do they have some role? Is there an advisory committee or a collaborative team? Is Does the knowledge and the issues being looked at, do they cross disciplines and are they cross sectoral, um, which is essential uh, to making changes in health equity? Um, are the contexts um, being considered um, beyond the university setting or the narrow um, health setting where that's being used and has there been a applied problem-solving proactive approach. Um, we found 48 models that we um, felt had enough credibility to then be analyzed against these factors. We found that these factors were largely absent, uh, particularly mention of intersectoral approaches. Um, and out of that study, we um, came up with a couple of recommendations. We recognize how difficult it is to shift norms of practice, um, to shift ingrained behavior, and to move towards um, systems of engagement that involve more sectors, disciplines, or community partners. And uh, with those issues in mind, we felt that it was critical to create more supportive structures, both for moving health equity forward and for engaging in evolving and non-clinical forms of um, knowledge translation. And we particularly encouraged and explained knowledge brokering, which was a feature of the top ranked model.